my Strathmore 400 series 18 by 24 drawing paper. If you notice, I added a border at my edges just for the sake of the demo so I can utilize the actual uh, entire sheet of paper um, for the actual demo, okay? So we have our materials, which is the kneaded eraser, which looks like this, okay? And this kneaded eraser is shaped as a, as a box, but once you open it, obviously it becomes a more puttier, uh, more tactile uh, piece of an eraser that you could mold and sort of shape to an actual eraser, okay? This is what it looks like after a few years, okay? So what it pretty much is, is a ball of rubbery erasing, okay? And this is a great material to use when you're adding texture, when you're utilizing, <coughs> excuse me, um, surface areas from the drawing once it's either it's too dark or too light, you can add, start to either erase or kind of dab into some of these areas to actually create some light, which is gonna be used to your advantage. Let me add one other person. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. Okay. So that's the needed eraser. We also have our white standard, obviously this is not white anymore, but uh, this is used multiple times, our white standard eraser, okay? We do have our compressed, okay? We do have our compressed charcoals. And the beauty of the compressed charcoal, again, it's the, the charcoal that's uh, kind of sort of divided into a perfect square that's elongated. Uh, it's a little bit heavier than the vine. The vine is gonna be a little bit more rounder. Uh, the compressed is extremely dark. And this is one that's been broken uh, that's been used before that I'm going to utilize for the demo. Here is the uh, example of the vine. Again, the vine is much more rounded, okay? It's much more softer. It's really light. It really feels like nothing is in my hand. That's how light it is, okay? Uh, and that's pretty much it in terms of materials. I do have a kind of piece of uh, paper towel just in case if I want to build upon texture, if I want to clean some of my surfaces off on some of my areas, want to blend in some of the shadows or darks, um, or for the sake of just not utilizing my oils from my hand, I can open up the entire uh, piece of paper towel. And while I'm working, I can actually put my hand directly on top of it. So underneath will have my previous drawing that I was working on. So I don't have to worry about smearing or sort of making the sort of mistakes, okay? Any questions about materials? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, um, this is Mika. Go ahead, Mika. I think on our list we are also given willow charcoal. Correct, you should be having willow, uh, vine, and compressed. Thank you for that. So, that, yes, I do have willow, which I'm gonna be utilizing as well. Oh, you know what? I completely forgot. We also have the compressed white, which I completely forgot to add, okay? Again, it's uh, the same thing like the compressed uh, black charcoal. It's gonna be utilized for your cooler uh, highlights for the sake of the demo, okay? Let me put that on the side. And here is the willow, which is, looks pretty much exactly like the vine. It's gonna be a little bit more sharper, much more uh, edgier. And the way you can get familiar with this is that when you're utilizing the vine versus the willow to the compress, you can see how different they are. And uh, if you do have your materials today, um, I would recommend if you want to, you could also just follow along and practice uh, just for the sake of the demo uh, or just for the sake of the assignment itself, just to practice and get familiar. Um, again, we're utilizing this still life with the, uh, the llama portrait, or excuse me, the llama planter, I should say from uh, what's available online on Canvas. I'm gonna be utilizing that as my reference. And just for the sake of the assignment, again, I always, always wanna start off with my vine, okay? Vine is extremely easy to erase, extremely easy to kind of manipulate before I get into my compressed. So try to think about this in that sort of format. Your compressed is always later, okay? Your compress is really made for your darks. 
are your harsher lines in terms of some of your compositions. Those of you have, uh, richer textures, richer line quality from some of your objects, you want to use your compressed uh, excuse, uh, before you use your vine because your vine is going to be a lot more softer, but the vine is going to be easily erasable. So think about that, okay? What questions do we have so far? I'm just going to grab another piece of the vine. Okay. So I'd like to. Um, I have a question, real quick. Are these all like labeled in our box? They should be. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So they look like this, actually. Let me bring that up right now. Hold on. That's actually a good question. Thank you for bringing that up. So we have the vine, okay? The green box, the willow, the blue box, the compressed, and the white compressed. That's what it should look like. Do we have questions about this? And obviously, uh, as you all know, the needed eraser for the sake of this assignment. Questions? Alrighty, let me just put this back. Are we uh, going to use charcoal pencil? No, the only reason why is because charcoal pencil is much more uh, controlled. Um, part of this assignment, guys, I want you to kind of get your hands dirty, and you will get dirty, okay? And I want you to sort of experiment and utilize the compressed and the vine and the willow to really manipulate and sort of break apart um, when you're making your drawings. The graphites and the uh, charcoal pencils limit you within the sort of the textures you're gonna build because I want you then to slowly incorporate some of the blending techniques, whether if it's using, utilizing your fingers or utilizing other materials like a paper towel or a sort of uh, a tissue cloth and you'll start to see how different you can start to create some of those materials and those layering process from uh, dark shadows and lighter shadows when you start to create your drawing. Who asked that question? I forgot to ask. Uh, that was me, Evan. Evan? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the sake of this assignment, let's try to keep with the, with the materials that we have um, in the supply kits, if it's possible. If you want to later down the road experiment with those charcoal pencils, you can if you want to, but just for the sake of this assignment, just try to keep with the, the limited uh, materials in our actual supply kits, okay. Alrighty, so again, I like to think about it all uh, as one sort of perspective, uh, perspectival space. When I'm looking at my reference, again, which is written uh, directly uh, as my observation, um, not worrying about any of my details, not worrying about any sort of uh, refined spaces. I want to generally just sort of map out where things are going to be, okay? And I can do this very loosely. And you, what, it, what you want to do is think about your actual reference when you're documenting your work as your picture plane, okay? So really think about that. So the sort of the edges and the corners and the sides of my sheet of paper as the sort of border of where things are going to be, right? So for example, the planter of the llama is right about, I would say, right about here. Notice how quickly I'm working. So this is essentially the skeleton that I was mentioning that I was asking if we could use graphite for? Correct. Yes, thank you, uh, Dio, for asking that question because this is where the sort of preliminary drawing happens. And that's my llama, okay? Very rough, very, very loose, okay? It's very impressionistic. What you want, just to kind of map out where things could be. So for example, I can then now, let's say if I made a mistake, right? If 
let's say if the head was too long or the neck was too wide or the base of the body was too uh, in within that perspective in terms of the length, I can take my kneaded eraser and erase it. And this is a lot easier to do once you're utilizing your kneaded eraser. You could also use your white eraser, but the white eraser is actually a lot easier for your compressed to remove some of the compressed marks, okay? Let's now go How back. does the kneaded eraser affect the texture and the, of the paper? If you were, let's say, to say you erased multiple times, does it wear down the paper like the rubber eraser would, or, over, or is it a little gentler? It is a lot more gentler, but over time, you'll start to see the surface of the paper start to get thinner and thinner. It shouldn't be that much, depending on the amount of pressure that you apply, which is important. Right? Depending on how much you actually uh, utilize, if you start to kind of like carve directly into your actual paper and start to like move so quickly and over time you'll start to see the surface quality starts to change. It may get smoother, it may get lighter, but it starts to start really damage the paper. And this is since it's 80 pounds, so it shouldn't be that uh, delicate, but it also should, it's not that rough to handle so much pressure because again, this is not a piece of wood. It's a piece, well actually technically it is because it's a piece of paper, but it's not as strong as a wooden panel or a canvas that can handle more pressure or they can handle more tooth in terms of that surface. Does that make sense? Oh wait, hold on. Oh, I need to admit one other person, sorry. Okay, now let's continue. Got my llama. Okay. Now I, I have my sort of that uh, really old um, Indian box from Bombay, which is right about here. Note, I'm, and I'm also noticing that's sort of where that sort of perspectival space is. And I'm also noticing the length between how wide this is and how wide this is. Also remembering the fact that even though my reference is not as wide as my piece of paper as my drawing, I need to factor that in. I need to be considerate and mindful of my picture plane, right? It's not exactly the same measurement of my actual uh, drawing paper. So I need to either compress everything down to the same scale or cut off some of those edges, which I think might be better to do in terms for the sake of the demo, okay? So now let me add here were the beads. Notice it's so rough. I'm just sort of mapping out where some of those objects are. Because I know this is going to be foreshortened, so it's going to be coming directly at us as the viewer, right? Here's my lemon. Okay, really roughly made. And then I'm noticing the candle is going to be cut off from this picture plane, so I'm just going to add the uh, rose quartz uh, rock which is going to be right about there. Also going to end up, uh, um, lay down a sort of line, uh, perspectival uh, plane here to indicate that sort of, that's the area that's been elevated on that surface. And right about here is where that area has been elevated from, where the uh, glass cloche is going to be, which is right about, right about there, okay? So we have a rough estimate of where things are going to be, okay? Plant. Okay. Do we see that? Yeah. Okay. What about my background? Now, this is where it gets really interesting because part of this process at this early stage is it's roughly made. You're just mapping out and sort of gridding out where your composition is going to be. Okay. You're not focusing on the details. You're not worried about the lights and the darks yet. You want to sort of map out where all the arrangement of the objects are. Okay. Now I'm going to add some lines for the background. If things overlap each other, it's completely okay. And I know this is glass. And I know, knowing that this is glass, it's transparent. So I'm gonna add the marks behind it, which are the drapery of the fabric of the background. 
And once I get into kind of these areas here, where it touches the sort of platform here of where that gallon of paint is underneath the fabric and right where the background is meeting, I know this area is really dark, okay? I can also break down my vine, make a smaller amount and use that with my index and my thumb and kind of like really push a little bit more pressure on the side of that uh, vine to add and fill that in just to indicate that's where the shadow is. You can take your finger and slowly blend it in there to remember the fact that, okay, that's a shadow. That's where that dark area can be. I can then go back with my compressed and add in more value, okay? But now let me start to use the side of my vine to start to refine more of my llama, the planter of the llama. I'm assuming it's a, yeah, it's a llama, yeah. It's not, a, I was gonna say it's a, a camel, but it doesn't look like a camel. Just in my mouth of my llama. My mouth of the llama. Excuse me, my eye of the llama. Everybody see that? And I'm gonna zoom in the camera so we can get a more detailed image once I add in a little bit more of the uh, refined edges. Using the tip of the compressed, not adding that much pressure. I wanna add very loosely, okay? chest of the animal which is right about there again you i'm going over my beads which is completely okay because i'm gonna i'm back to it add in some value right about here on the side of the llama, and blend some of that in there. You can also go back and go make some of these lines refined. And this is where the base of the llama is. And obviously I know that the box is in front of the one half of the, the llama as the planter. So I need to remember that. Again, very loose. But I'm gonna go over it, assuming that it's actually something I can physically see. Because once I go back and start to refine some of the jewelry box from India, I can then make some more dark marks sort of kind of make some of those edges come alive. I'm gonna now add some just value around the llama. One second, let me add one other person. Okay. Add some value here. Oh, let me add one other person. How are we doing on time? Then now go back and kind of make some refined marks on some of the legs of the, of the animal. And I know obviously that's where the beads are in the base of the actual animal. But then let's say, for example, now I'm going to take my kneaded eraser. This is where the fun part happens. Really get in there, start to knead as much as you can, bend and start kind of stretch out that kneaded eraser. I like to cut it in half because I don't need the whole thing. Okay, you could also put it in a bowl. 
so I can use my entire hand because my fingers are not that strong and use more force to kind of apply more pressure and it, it, it becomes much more softer, kind of more easier to knead and kind of bend. And you want a lighter area of the, the gray of the kneaded eraser. I like to put it on my hand and my paw and kind of make a circular clockwise direction to kind of make it flat. And I can now add texture by just dabbing. Or I can actually just go in there and start blending some of these areas and start erasing to make some highlights. And this is all in a kind of circular motion. And my llama looks a little angry, but that's okay. I want to build upon a certain texture so I can kind of get a nice value between lights and darks. Okay. Now, I'm going to add, I'm now going to switch to my compressed. Okay, here's a small piece that I've broken off of the compressed. And you can start to see, I'm going to add in some darks here, the side of the compressed. That is a huge jump, right, from dark. If I blend that in there, it's a lot more visible, right? So really look at that intensity and be mindful of how much dark you wanna add. I'm gonna zoom in the camera a little bit so we can start to see a little bit better. And just add in some of those marks. Again, you wanna really try to focus on the sort of reference that you're looking at. about here. Take my fingers. And again, sometimes your fingers are your best friends in this process because you really can have some fun with blending some of these darks and lights. And you really can get some intensities between adding these darks onto that surface. Can we see the llama now? <laughs> he looks a little angry. And I think that's hilarious. Let me zoom in a little bit. Sorry for the, I apologize for the value of the, or the shadow of the phone. Is that better? Okay. You can see how dark that is, right? You can see the dramatic notion of building upon these values with the light fine and then when you get into your compressed it come it becomes completely dark so i want you to guys to really think about <laughs> he looks like he has cat eyes there you go uh, i really want you guys to experiment in this process i'll be working on this uh, the actual still life even further and let's keep working on the reference one more time hold on is that correct? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, what questions do we have so far before I continue? Okay. I'm now going to use the compressed to kind of fill in some of these shadows in my fabric. And I think that's where the fun happens when you're adding a lot of fabrics or a drapery in the background. You can start to have really interesting marks in some of these areas. What's it going to darken some of those areas? And that will highlight my llama even further, going around the llama. Remember that the neck is a lot more elongated. You can start to see now the llama becomes much more refined and it literally pops out from the darkness that we added around the llama, okay? If you take your white eraser, you can start to 
erase some of the compressed, it's gonna be somewhat a little bit harder because the compressed is really, really dark, but you will still have like a ghost image of those marks that you made earlier. But just in case, if you made multiple areas that you wanna erase uh, as like an accident on the drawing, you can. That's why I always advise students to really take your time. Don't apply too much pressure in your drawings. The neck is a little skinny. That's like choking, which I don't want because I want it to be a little bit fuller. And I kind of like even use this like a paintbrush as a way of blending some of those areas. And some of the remnants of where that uh, eraser has been removed from the actual eraser, I'm gonna blend some of those areas with the charcoal to kind of get an interesting texture. And you can start to see what happens within that. I can then now switch back to my vine and make more refined areas within the animal. And right about here where the left side of the neck is, I know that's uh, a lot more uh, with value. So I'm gonna add, instead of using the compress, I'm gonna use my vine. Cause I wanna so sort of separate the two when I'm looking at my drawing and not blend too much of that in there. Okay, and I can go back and I'm always constantly switching back from compressed to the vine. And you can start to see, now I'm adding, you zoom in. You see that? You can start to see that variation between a lighter gray and a darker gray. Does that make sense? I love how aggressive the llama is looking. Looks like it's upset, which is fantastic. Okay. So at this stage, guys, I'm gonna be working on the demo a little bit further. And then I, again, I will upload this onto Canvas under the video demonstration. Uh, again, that reference is also gonna be available on canvas.com. So keep that in mind. Uh, what questions do we have? Does it um, matter it, when we take the still photo reference, whether it's vertical, horizontal, and when we draw that, would we also do it in the like same direction too, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, no, that does make sense. You can have any orientation you would like, vertical or horizontal. Just make sure just to uh, send me as, a, as an assignment when you upload your reference material make sure that it is vertical or horizontal. I'll leave the option depending on if you want to keep your drawing paper pad uh, at that orientation, if you want to work more horizontal or, or vertical, it's really up to you. Uh, whatever works and whatever is going to be more comfortable, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Mika. Would you suggest working on one object at a time or would you suggest working on the whole piece? You know, Mika, there's so many ways you can go about doing this. This is one way. This is one object at a time. But we also sort of mapped out where everything is. So it does help once you sort of create your composition and sort of map out with your vine charcoal um, the entire image so you can see how large things are uh, in relationship to one another. You can see how the perspective is going to change slightly if things are at an angle, things are foreshortening. So I would try to, uh, I would recommend and advise you guys to start to map out your drawings with the vine and start to draw out everything without worrying about detail. It's a rough sort of abstract sort of gesture around the entire drawing first. Then we can go back and sort of refine some of these areas which we're, what we're doing to the llama right now, for example. Did that make sense? Yes. You can see, obviously, we still, have, we still have the beads, we have the lemon, we have the rose quartz uh, rock, we have the box of the jewelry, and even the glass cloche. 
that we can uh, work on a little bit further. Any other questions? Um, this is Nancy. Do you recommend like uh, toning our paper before we start or just? You know, Nancy, you can do that if you want to. Let's do, you know what, let's actually do that now. I'm going to cover the entire thing. Hold on, let me, sorry. Somebody was calling, I'm going to ignore that. Uh, I'm going to do the entire thing, just for the sake of the demo. I've actually seen students do this as well, just for the sake of practicing. And this is the vine I'm using, using the side of the vine. You can see how strong the compressed is because it's actually seeping directly through. I'm going to my edge. I'm going to move to this side. Okay. Just go to this corner. I'm noticing I'm just using a finger and just applying pressure directly onto the surface of the paper. Some remnants of the compressed or of the vine left. Now, who asked who asked that question? Was it Nancy? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Nancy, now what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna blend this in with my fingers. It doesn't have to be super refined or super even throughout the edges of the paper. And again, this is the part where charcoal can be really forgiving or really unforgiving. And I've actually seen now from this stage, assuming obviously the compress is not there, the, the drawing that we did before, use your kneaded eraser and actually map out the entire composition with just the eraser. So should, do you recommend when you're starting to do this first before going into the steps you did before? No, because it's really up to you. I want you to experiment what works well for you. What's going to happen best when you arrange your own still life at home and you'll start to see what sort of direction or approach or even strategy you want to utilize once you're creating your drawings. But then now you, you, do, you do that make sense? Yes, when you do this, what do you prefer and why? I mean, there's so many ways I like to personally go about doing this. I like to work really loosely. Um, I, for some odd reason, I think for me, bigger is uh, much more uh, forgiving because I can make more mistakes, I can make more errors I can encounter. And then I like to go back and start to refine some of those areas because I like to take intermediate breaks. I like to stop if I'm frustrated. I don't want to rush any of this, okay? Which I have something that we're, we're going to constantly come back to, is that this process is going to be time consuming. So don't inundate yourself and fo focus so much on a one class period and say, I have to finish this drawing. I want you to expand your time. Have a few hours here, have a, a, an hour there, an hour there, and another day, and it's kind of span out your schedule because you, then you will know what works best for you. How I personally work is I work better at night. So I feel like artistically, my best sort of directions are coming out during the nighttime. I don't know why, but uh, part of this process is like, if I wanted to work in the morning, depending on sort of the directions I wanna to lean towards, being much more looser and the preliminary drawing that I started before helps me understand where the framework or the foundation of the drawing will start. Then I can worry about details later. There is that tendency when you're when, when all of us are working on our drawings, regardless of this assignment or the next or the next view, is that detail is more important than the entire composition. 
which is false. It's really depending on how well we can read the composition in order to understand where that detail is coming from. Because I see a lot of students who are struggling with too much of the smaller problems or the smaller issues of, uh, of the drawing, they're not looking at it holistically as the entire image, which falls through a lot of time. Then we lose a lot of time and therefore we lose a lot of the sort of the assignment that's gonna be completed, which is the problem. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to do this, right? It's really, you have to learn to experiment and see what's working for you and what's, what's more familiar on your side so you can see what works best for the individual. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, with um, past students on this, what do you find people, what roadblocks do other students hit uh, in regards to when they're doing this? It's really the sort of the idea of time management. I mean, that's one of the biggest issue of any studio based course is utilizing your time wisely, utilizing the studio time to be making the work. And that's where the opportunity of you asking questions, students asking questions saying, Hey, Ayad, I'm a little worried about like this side of my drawing or this side, it looks a little flat. How do I sort of refine them some of these edges? Should I add more dark here? Uh, why is my llama distorted? How, how can I fix that composition? That's where the opportunity we can talk more one on one of how we can sort of help refine some of those rendering techniques in a way that it's going to benefit your drawing. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Of course. What other questions do we have? Notice I'm just using the needed eraser. Just I'm just literally blocking this in in the same way we think about planar analysis or sort of kind of thinking about plane, picture planes. I'm just sort of blocking in my composition, not worrying about any details. My box is right about there. My beads or yeah, beads. Nancy, can you see this? Now you can start to see yeah. where some of those areas are. And then I can start to use, I can use my needed eraser as an actual pencil mark. So you can start to make some lines. Kind of say, okay, there's my curves of my fabric right about in there. And you can start to see the image comes to life. Once I can also go back and start adding in some more compressed charcoal. I like to attack my drawings. This is gonna sound strange, but like depending on the surface quality, since we're working with paper, you could really be aggressive about this. And sometimes some of these rich textures that you start to create when you're experimenting have some really interesting reflections between the lights and the darks. My lemon. Make the composition right there. There's my lemon. Take go back. Add my compress. Sorry, my camera was slightly moving. Come around the lemon. Make my the tip of the lemon. Blend some of those areas. We're dabbing some of the compressed. Gotta blend some of that area in. Those were the beads. Do you guys see that? Where the composition is? How they bend and curve. Take my compressed, excuse me, my, my, my vine. After you've toned it, can, on your perspective, maybe we can't see it in the camera, can you still see the lines of the original sketch out that you did? Let's see if I can zoom in. 
Can we see that? Yeah, it's not visible to me. Um, it's not but, visible but, on, on the camera, but I uh, do. I do see some some of the remnants of what we made earlier. Cool. But uh, for example, I'm gonna. I want to get the phone. Sorry. Oh, I could just move this. Well, that's smart. There you go. Hold on. And then just come to this edge. Let's add some white, shall we? I'm going to break off a piece. And now, for example, if I wanted to add a highlight to my lemon, it's going to be a little bit harder to see. But you can start to see there's a kind of a cool gray tint to the lemon. Let me refine this, sorry. There you go. And it's gonna help if I add a little bit more darks. Okay. Use my finger, kind of soften some of those edges because I want my lemon to be more um, fruitier and I can apply more pressure on it depending how much I need. Add some whites around it. And the whites have an interesting sort of texture because it almost becomes cooler in that sort of layer. But then if I want to go back with my compress, start adding more like spots and dots on my lemon. Kind of, kind of build upon that texture. Just stippling my way through here. Let me find some of these areas. That's where they other beads are right about there. Oh, sorry. Somebody was calling. Just had to ignore that. And I'm going to blend some of these areas with my finger. Take my white and start making some same, similar marks. Sort of attacking that surface of the lemon. But then now I can take my white eraser and sort of push them together to make a texture. And this is just one way you could build upon adding those compressed black and whites together to make a kind of interesting gradient of a gray. Do we see that? What questions do we have, guys? Uh, hi, it's Sarian. Um, Go ahead, Arian. Do you have to worry about like getting the black charcoal on your like your white stick while you're working? They do mesh together, so keep that in mind. They become more cooler. What I mean by that, there's almost a, a bluish tint to it, so it becomes like less of a warmer light and more of a cooler light. But the best way to go about it, depending on the reference that you're looking at and depending on the sort of composition that we're going to be relying on for your drawings, uh, you have to really experiment and see what works well. Maybe if it's a texture you're trying to build upon, it could work. But notice here, once I blended both of them together, it almost became a cooler gray. And if this is not something I want, I can also take my finger and blend the entire thing together. and see if that's working or not. And then depending if it is, there you go, sorry, the light was covering in the shadow. I can make that decision, okay, am I happy with that sort of texture? And if I'm not, I either need to erase it or work over it, okay? Does that make sense? Carry on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about like, you know, you do some white shading or uh, blending, and then you like go to draw somewhere else, and your the stick itself is like been tainted permanently by black charcoal. Yeah, 
you are going to you are going to encounter that multiple times. Okay. And again, this is where charcoal can become really forgiving or unforgiving. You have to really push and play within this process. A good rule of thumb would be just to work with your vine first. Then when you want to go back and add some darks, go to your compress because the compress is a lot harder to erase. Think about it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. You're very but, welcome. This what is up? Leah. Are what? you, um, I, I feel like I tend to be really heavy when I'm trying to draw. Like I, I'm like almost like tense. Are you, are you think, are you like, altering how hard you press with this or is it all the same and yeah how hard are you pressing that's a great question depending on the pressure mm -hmm. that i'm applying all of this was the same amount of pressure okay what's interesting is that once i apply more pressure you'll start to see what happens for example if i made a mark you guys see that if i made the same mark with more pressure that's a big difference right that's a huge difference let me just zoom in Okay, do you see that? That's massive. Let's do the same thing with the value. So if I make, I'm using the side of the compressed, right? Make a circle, right? Do you see that? Let's do the same thing here. It almost becomes like a, like a black hole in the galaxy. But you could use that to your advantage. What if I start to notice some of the particles that, I, that came off? use that to blend some of those areas but once let's say for example going back to the previous question if i added white you can still see it but if i start blending let's make a circle here some of that white notice it becomes grayer i'm going to blend it even further it almost disappears but it's still gray it's not really black anymore, right? What would be the best way to reset the white stick if it has too much black? Like uh, just a paper towel to get the black off the stick? Not really, because once you once it's there, it's really difficult to remove. If I add another white, notice that's not as white as the previous mark. Let's say if I added the kneaded eraser, what's gonna happen? So some of it came off. What about the white eraser? You can see more of it came off. So the white is really great when you're utilizing the eraser to remove some of the need, uh, compressed. The kneaded is great to remove some of the vine. Uh, I Sorry, um, my question was more focused on the tool of the white oh, charcoal, not, not, the, not the application. You're talking, uh, Dio. You were talking about if you added more white directly onto the black compressed. No, on your actual white charcoal stick. Yeah. When it's contaminated and it has a lot of other charcoals, what's the best way to make that again so then it's white? Is it just wipe oh. it with a dry cloth? You can. Is there a chemical that you use? Just. I would not use any chemicals if I were you guys, but you can wipe it off. Let me do that now. Hold on, let me get, grab my paper towel. Thank you. I just wanted to know if there was a specific way to reset it because it's kind of like a white eyeliner pencil. And once that's yeah. messed up, it's, you can't really use it for what you want to use it for. Because they're not oil-based, and that's actually a great question. Thank you for that. They're not oil-based because they're uh, actually water-based. You can actually mix a little bit of water on this. But I like to use a paper towel to kind of remove some of that area. And you can see it goes back to enough to work with. Perfect, thank you, that's what I wanted to know. Sure, let's actually add a little bit of water, see what happens to, for the sake of the demo. Okay, there's a little bit of water on the toilet, on the paper towel. Oh yeah, the water takes it off beautifully. You can see the, the remains on there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, let's do it again, just in case, so you can start to see, you guys can see this. But now notice, I notice now some of it's on my skin. I've actually seen students experiment with some of the compressed uh, white charcoal and add some water. Because it's, it's water-based, you can, you can just start to dilute it if you would like. But since we're not working with washes yet, which we're going to work with the next uh, few assignments later on, 
um, we're going to be just using the compressed white um, as a dry medium because if once you get into the wet mediums things become much more looser and we have to wait for them to dry which we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into our ink wash uh, landscapes. What other questions we have? Can you crush charcoal and then paint it on with a brush? You can. Let's do that now. Thank you. Just trying to think of other yep. ways to use it. <laughs> Let's move to this, this area. All right, I can crush it with. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me see if this is possible. Oh, no, no, no. I have a palette. Palette knife. So I can take a palette knife, I can still do okay. It almost becomes like a, uh, a rough, chalky, uh, almost dirt-like material. And then let's see if you add a little bit. My hand's a little wet, so we can start to see. It's actually really the same texture, if you really think about it, because it's still a little, yeah, it, it does seem the exact same texture on here. So it doesn't really change the difference in terms of the, the consistency or the viscosity of thick or thin. Um, in the same way, we, I mean, if this was an oil painting, it will change depending on the medium that you use, depending how much we dilute this with the amount of medium or uh, linseed oil or paint thinner or gamosol, depending on the medium, but it's, it's withdrawing in this stage. I think you could just mix uh, a little bit of water. You could grind it into a uh, more refined texture and see what happens and experiment from there, add a little bit more water. And also changing the temperature of the water from hot to cold may change the consistency of the material, which will be interesting to see. Uh, you could experiment if you want, those of you who are interested to do that, but I would say for the sake of the assignment, just let's try to stick to the dry on dry, if possible. Mm -hmm. Want to expect, um, experiment more? I'm going to leave that up to you. I was just wondering if you could draw it on kind of like you would with like face paint, uh, face powders, and uh, I, I, I use a lot of makeup for art looks, so I was wondering if it would go on like an eyeshadow to paper. It's interesting you say that because I actually had a student who worked with models for their one-on-two -on -one assignments. They brought in their physical models. And what they, uh, forgetting the name of the students, um, but what they brought in was uh, painted directly onto the model. So they wanted to kind of manipulate their skin and see how things can be perceived within makeup. And it was whether if it's house paint, no, it wasn't house, it was makeup only because house paint had a lot more lead. Uh, these are uh, not gonna be harmful materials, but they will, you know, over time, I'm used to kind of being really, really dirty with my hands, but if you really wanna get it off your skin, a really good rule of thumb is just using soap and water. Um, but when we're getting into painting, like painting onto flesh, uh, makeup is obviously made for flesh, it's not made for, um, painting a mural like on a concrete wall because it's not going to adhere as much. I mean, it's possible, but there are, you know, certain chemicals, certain, um, again, mediums, uh, varnishes, fixatives that we can somehow manipulate and change the sort of texture on that, which is a whole nother conversation for painting. But yeah, cry Krylon's the paint that you use for skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've never personally worked on skin myself, but um, you know, it's possible. And the student that was working with uh, the models that uh, they brought in, it was just so fascinating to see that you know, there are no really no limits to what you can do as a drawing. Uh, and I sort of allowed that to happen in the class because it was one one two, uh, And they really wanted just to experiment to see how far they can go to see in terms of experimenting on skins whether it's the back, the chest, the face, the entire body, which was really challenging. It took multiple hours. Uh, and I don't know how that model would have had, uh, had enough time to do that, but you know, it's possible. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, Dio. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, looking at the texture and how you applied it, uh, seems like it would work how I was thinking. I was just trying to figure out other ways to apply uh, product throughout the space without necessarily using oils and fingers and things like that. You know, there's so many ways to do this. Again, this is just one way. Um, again, it's not necessarily the right way. This is how technically I was taught. And um, it's really, you have to find what works for best for you, for all of you. I should say, because it's interesting because I, I can guarantee you on next Tuesday when we have our critique, uh, there are going to be conversations where we have, you know, problems we're going to encounter, dilemmas we're going to face, or uh, situations where you need more time, and which is always the biggest issue. But it's really depending on how you go about doing this. You know, you really have to kind of find what works for you the best and go from there. And I, my best sort of advice for everybody would be just try your best. And if you need more help, just feel free, feel free to pop in the meetings on Thursday mornings from 9 to 11.15, and I can try to help you more one-on-one. -on -one. Questions? I'm going to end the recording, and then give me one second so I can, how do I stop this? Hold on.